Well, um, this morning we were in, let's give you a recap real quick. We were in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Um, that's not, before you start turning, that's not where we're going to be tonight. Yeah, I'm just recapping. All right. <laughs> uh, the message this morning, the topic was about submission. Wives submitting to their husbands. Husbands honoring their wives. There's lots of different translations, different words that they use. Um, husbands are told to uh, deal with their wives with understanding. That's another one that I read. Um, uh, peaceably uh, to be with their wives. But basically, basically, it's the title. I titled it. I don't ever tell you my, what my title is, but it's called a dual submission. It's it's basically both both individual parts have a role in the marriage. The wife is to submit in the way that the church submits to Jesus. But the husband is supposed to treat the wife the way that Jesus treats the church. If you do those things, if those things work the way that God has designed them to work, it's love in its most purest form. It's the only way that love can work. That's true love. The world has a definition of love. The world thinks it knows what love is. And, and they're not exactly wrong. See, that's the thing about a lie or um, a false truth. Not necessarily a lie. It's partly true. That's the thing about lies. It, it usually has a part of truth to it. The love that the world sees, the way that they define it, is mostly emotional. Now, can you love someone without having an emotional change? No. You, emotion is a result of the love. But it's, it's not necessarily the definition of it. And it's not the only product of love. So when they focus on the emotion of love, and you know, love at first sight, or you get this gasping feeling. And, and we see it when, when David, in the story of David that we, we, recently, we recently studied about his daughter Tamar and his son uh, Amnon, where it says Amnon loved his sister and then later we read that story, and I don't want to get into that again, but he read, we read that story, and it wasn't love that he felt. It was pure, sinful lust and just evil. But he confused it with love. And that's one of the things that the world does right now and has done since the beginning of time is they confuse what love is. Well, I recently got the chance to do my first wedding as a minister. And it was very weird, which this entire year is weird, um, I'll never forget my first Easter because we couldn't be here. It's the first Easter I've ever preached. I'll never forget my first revival because couldn't do it here, right? I'll never forget. Um, uh, you forgot it. Yeah, I forgot it. Yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget my first wedding because nobody was there. We did it over Zoom. So Norwex, if you didn't know, Norwex and uh, uh, Zoom have all made a ton of money this this year because did you know what zoom was before 2020 yeah. <laughs> zoom, zoom is uh everybody's doing these zoom meetings now like you go you download it on your laptop or your ipad or your phone or whatever and you can you can have a hundred people up and that was one of the things that the webster county school did with the kids is they had these zoom classes and zoom meetings so anyway 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 I did a wedding over Zoom, and it went really well. But in preparing for the wedding, I mean, I, I'm, I go overboard, and I don't mean to, so I'm really not going to tonight. But when I study something, I say, if I'm going to preach on this thing, or if I'm going to do this thing, and this is, this is partly why I became a minister, is because when I started believing in Jesus, I said, okay, what does that mean? And that's a loaded question. What do I really believe in? Well, let me, let me figure it out. So you start studying, and you... You have to learn everything about baptism. You have to learn everything about the Trinity. You have to learn about the Holy Spirit. What is it that I believe if somebody asked me? So I went into marriage and I studied about marriage. And out of everything that I read, you know the one place, the one place that it sent me to every time? First Corinthians chapter 13. Every single time. And, I, and that's cliche. But it is the ultimate. Even secular people, the world, when they go, when you go to a wedding or whatever, they'll know. Secular people will know. First Corinthians chapter thirteen. That is the definition of love. I would like to start tonight with First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-seven. See, 
Paul leads into this, this is more of a, a sermon type of letter that he's writing. He's trying to teach them something about a lot of different things. But what he's talking about right here, if you back up and you see before he enters into the topic of love, he's talking about the body of Christ and many members. Like all of us are members of this church and all of us have a role and all of us have a job the same way that a husband and wife are the heads of the family and they each have a job and each one is different. Does that mean that I can't do part of my wife's job? Absolutely not. Have you ever worked in a place that really has a good cohesive teamwork and you got people that'll pick up the slack when somebody else is falling down? That's the best place in the world to work. If you've got somebody that's not necessarily my job, that's not my job description. That is not what I signed up for, I'm not doing it. That's a bad place to work. When you got somebody that sees that you're falling behind on the production line or that you're struggling or you know whatever it is, and they come over and they lend a hand without needing an attaboy or a pat on the back, or, that's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way a marriage should be. But each individual portion of that marriage should know what the role is. They should know ultimately, this is where I am the mother. Ultimately, I am the father. Now, uh, I was given some given some clothes recently by, by a family member. I love I love that he he gives, he gives me his hand me downs. I'll take them all day. Um, I'm very very grateful of it. But there's there's a shirt that he that he gave me that's that's really I mean super hot pink, super hot, and it's a nice polo shirt, really nice. And uh, we washed all the clothes and we pulled it out, folded them, and. Uh, uh, I think it was I think it was my son Ethan. Ethan looked. He said, "Mommy, mommy shirt, mommy." And uh, I was like, "No, that's, that's mine. That's mine." We all have a role, and it should be recognizable what that role is. So here's what here's what Paul says to the church in Corinth. It says in verse 27, "Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church first apostles." Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I'll show you a more excellent way. Let's stop there for just a second because I don't want to get into 13 until we talk about that. First, we're all one body, but we're individual members. We're autonomous individuals that make our own decisions. We take the information that we're given, we interpret it, we digest it, we process it, and then we make a decision based on that. But each individual person, whatever decision they're making, it ultimately reflects on and affects the church as a whole, as one body. Not just this church, but every church that represents Jesus Christ. We are his representatives in the world. When they see us in this world, they should see us as representatives of him. And when they do, they should see what he wants us to reflect in his word, what his true character is. Then it tells us who is most important out of this? First apostles, then prophets, and then teachers, and then miracle workers. Do you see how the hierarchy runs down from someone, an, an apostle, a very specific definition for a person to be an apostle. They had to have firsthand, have a firsthand encounter with Jesus Christ. So there's not many apostles in the world. Um, there definitely aren't right now, you know. But uh, so you were an apostle, then you were a prophet. And there's a lot of scriptures that talk about that, how the prophets were, were less than. Um, the prophets are really looked at on with the angels, that they're a particular type of people that were given a particular duty, that had a job. Most of the prophets, like we've talked about, never got to see their prophecies come to fulfillment. You know, so imagine that. Imagine being given a message and you're telling everybody about it and you die before it ever happens. Just, it's like a, a tree falls in the forest. Does it make a sound? Well, if your prophecy doesn't come true while you're still alive, does that mean it's not? No, but they believed with faith. And then teachers, so anyone who teaches, teaches. 
who, like what we're doing right here, or Sunday school, or um, anything like that. And then miracle workers. Now, this is this is what I want to say, and I'm, I'm trying not to take too much time. I would never in a million years, ever, put myself, say, because I'm a pastor, or I've, just, I've, I've taken on the role that I'm, I'm better than a miracle worker. Look at me. Watch me go. That's, I, I can't understand that hierarchy, but that's not for me to understand. It's not. The book of Acts tells us that Peter, now Peter's, a, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, next Sunday a little bit, Peter's a very significant individual in the Bible. Uh, he was an apostle. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. He was a miracle worker. They say, the book of Acts tells us that people were healed when his shadow cast over them. As he walked by, they were healed. That's the Holy Spirit. That's power, you know. And, and so I would never, ever in a million, but that's what he says. There's a role that everyone has. And it, we all strive to play our part. What we don't want to do is fight and bicker over whose role is more important or what gift is better and this, that, and the other. And, uh, well, I'm a tongues and I'm a, I'm a healer and I'm a teacher and I'm, well, I'm in charge of this joint and this, that. Never in a million years. Because he, he leads into 13 which tells us everything we need to know about everything. Everything. Love means everything. That's the message. Jesus did everything he did out of love. A marriage only works if there's love. A church can only succeed if it has love. And that's what Paul's message here is. So what he says out of the New King James Version is this. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though by the same, oh no, sorry. And though I, I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, but where whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. What Paul tells us and what I, what I hope to convey tonight is no matter who we are, be us, be an apostle, prophet, uh, a uh, teacher, healer, uh, someone who's gifted with speaking in tongues. No matter what we do, if we give all the way unto the poor, if we preach God's word with power, if we can make everything as plain as can possibly be and give all that knowledge to everyone, if we do the best possible works give everything away, bring people into the church, increase in membership, build buildings, have gyms. No matter what we do, if it's 
done out of anything other than love, then it's a failure. It's what God tells us. Jesus did not do what he did on the cross so that he could hold his head high in heaven someday and tell us, that's right, I did that for you. And so he could get a pat on the back. He did not do it so that um, he could check the box and say that he served his purpose and now he's going to retire and he's done. Did my part and step away. That is not what drove him to the cross. What drove him there was love. It's the same element. It's the same uh, emotion. It's the same truth that should drive us in every decision that we make. And not just love for our wives and our husbands, not just love for our church and our church family, not just love for um, our families, our personal little circles, but love for the whole world. Love the way that Jesus loves. Love for others and putting their needs above our own. We serve others before we serve ourselves because that's what Jesus tells us. That's what Jesus did. When he washed the disciples' feet, that's what he was telling them. Is I'm a king who came as a servant. They were expecting a warrior, and they got a servant. And that blew them away. And it made sense after the resurrection. It made sense after the cross. We have that knowledge. So let's, let's take a moment this Sunday night to remember what it is that we're called to do as Christians, that out of every work that we do, it has to be out of love. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say? Add to that anything at all? It's hard to follow the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's hard to expound on that because how can you argue with any part of that? Love does not envy. It, it, it doesn't seek to be provoked. If we strive to live a life that reflects that kind of love, when we live for other people, they'll take notice of it. When we do things for other people out of that kind of reverence and, and, and respect, but remembering that we're doing it out of love, I love you because Jesus loved you. I'm going to forgive you for hurting me because Jesus can forgive you. If Jesus can forgive you, then I can. Because you owe him way more than you owe me. You'll never be able to pay him back, but he gave it to you anyway. So because of that, I love you. When we live like that, they take notice of it. And those are the things that bring them to Jesus. Those are the things that really reflect his light and his truth. So with that, if you would, I'd like to, I'd like to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to tell you that we love you. We love you because you first loved us. We pray that we can remember as we go from here to live a life that is not only full of love, but reflects your love the way that you want us to. That all the decisions that we make and the things that we do reflects uh, a humble and submissive heart, not out of fear, but out of love and out of kindness, that we can be the people that you wanted Israel to be, but that they fail that, that we can be the believers in you, the representatives of you, and ultimately someday join you in the kingdom of heaven. We pray that you be with all those who are mentioned here, that you be with the lost, and that this church continues to do its work out of love. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. God bless y'all.